Hello, Professor. Good to see you. <clears throat> At least I have. Hello. Can time. you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, Hello? it's clear. Hi. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Can you hear me? Is it open for me? Yeah, Doctor Ayat, we can hear you. Can Hello, Zainab. Good to hear you. <laughs> Thank you. And Abdul Ghani. And Abdul Rahman. Nice to see you all. And Walid. Oh. Nice to see you too, Professor. Hello, everyone. Hello, Doctor. Uh, yeah, hello, all. Hello, everyone. Hello, Professor. Let me see this. USB audio. Professor, we can hear you just fine. Okay. So I will copy invitation for everyone. We'll give some minutes, Professor, till people come in. Is that okay? It has to be okay, of course. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we're using and WhatsApp to invite them all. Invite them all. Okay. Well, but everybody knows, so they should drop in, huh? Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, how is everyone, how is everyone teaching, teaching today? today? <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> Who was that? <laughs> uh, yes, uh, yes. Me. Okay. Well, okay, yes. I hope you peace well. Yeah, perfectly well. Uh, professor, uh, can I uh, can I comment or something uh, before we start before, uh, till, the, till, uh, till our colleagues uh, join us concerning last time because our group uh, didn't participate uh, with our, uh, our we were uh, group five. You were in group five. Yeah, but we didn't give our uh, 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 reflection on uh, on the on okay. the. Yeah. So, uh, uh, can I can I can I talk about something before our uh, colleagues tell our colleagues uh, join us? Yeah. Sure. Let's. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We we uh, we looked at uh, uh, how do you be? Okay. How do you be? Uh, from uh, different uh, perspectives. Uh, okay. A cultural one, uh, linguistics, linguistics, uh, linguistic one, and uh, and so on. And uh, uh, some of us uh, remember uh, thought that uh, because it's not uh, uh, phrased well in English uh, as an English language, it may be from another uh, uh, culture or another uh, another native uh, of another language. So uh, we uh, we say that uh, uh, he may be uh, uh, he may uh, refer to uh, the way you greet others. So uh, we can use uh, the language of uh, uh, body language, okay, in order to uh, to get uh, uh, to get connected or to interact to the other uh, uh, party. This is from the cultural part, and from uh, the linguistic part, uh, we were uh, I and uh, Dr. Heba and uh, Dr. Uh, Omar. Uh, he speaks French, so he said that in in French it uh, you can say. Uh, Lobbies or lobbies, something like this. Okay. In Arabic, by the way, uh, we we say uh, uh, as salamu as salamu uh, the beast. We use the definite uh, the definite article there uh, with peace, even if it's uh, in general. You know, if you say peace is in English, in Arabic we say the 
al salam we we add the okay so we add uh, the in two cases if we uh, say a specific piece okay like uh, for example if, if you say uh, the, the piece of uh, libya the money of uh, uh, of uh, of uh, mr so and so so sometimes we say the we add it to uh, un we we add the, the to the uh, to uh, to uh, uncountable uh, or uh, abstract abstract names uh, yes. in order to uh, yeah in order to uh, in Arabic in order to uh, say it in in general okay so uh, I don't want to to take more time but uh, I, I just uh, wanted to uh, to add uh, such points because I am interested in linguistics my my master is uh, in applied linguistics uh, cognitive linguistics and the schemata uh, and uh, the, the last session was uh, very interesting for me because it uh, it deals with some some of my uh, my work uh, uh, and by the way um, language as you said uh, is very important concerning the, the way we, we interact we may go on depending on the language itself thank you so much I have some, some examples, by the way, but I don't want to, uh, to uh, take more time. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Yeah, just uh, I, I repeat, since you mentioned that, that uh, this is the function of the definite article, always in all the languages where it is used. And I said, it seems to be so normal to us to use it that we usually don't think about it. But uh, with a closer look, we see that this is a particularity. If you if you compare the languages used in the world, this is a minority, but a very powerful one, because from ancient Greek, this has uh, well uh, disseminated in all the modern European languages, and then by colonialism, of course, spread all over the world. It's like a virus, and exactly the function is what you said. When I say that piece then I refer to what philosophy calls an, ascent, an essence. So I, I state there is an abstract, stable, clearly defined uh, notion of their peace. And this is what our mind does. It, it takes it as such. This is the, the synapses that are created because we are used to speak in the language we speak, we just automatically make it from that. And only if you really raise the question and say, so what is then that piece? We fail. Then we, we end up with negation. Then we say, yes, peace is the absence of war. Peace is the absence of physical violence. Or even this is what I tried to explain earlier. Even if we take the, the early definitions of Galtung, who brought in this distinction between physical violence and structural violence, even if you say positive peace is the absence of structural violence, which is another word for justice, so we say structural uh, peace uh, or positive peace is justice, then we end up with a very poor understanding because it's again a negation. So when, when is justice present? How can you define whether a situation or a relation, an encounter is 100% just? Who, who, whether you take the criteria for, we don't have that. It always depends on individual perceptions plus on concrete relations. This will be the topic we start with that today. So you have always this mix of individual perception and relational, the relational aspect. And this is, of course, uh, fluid. This is, not the, not, this is not fixed. Therefore, the idea that our mind gets by the use of the, uh, of the, of the, of the definite article is misleading. That's exactly the point. Yeah. So, and then, well, if we continue, then we have this, this idea of what is the difference between that piece and a piece. A piece is much softer, is, gives us much more individual interpretations and options, how we define our relations. And then if I go, if I turn away from a, a subject-oriented grammar, to a verb-oriented grammar, then I come to this strange thing of two Ps, which we can, in a way, somehow, I would say there are 
the ideas of that on the margins of European languages or general of modern languages. But this is very much used in extra European languages. I can give you an example as long as we are waiting for the others. Um, I, I give uh, German uh, lessons to a former student of mine from the Innsbruck program, so an alumna who wants to, to, to join. She's from Uganda and wants to join uh, in the doctorate in Vienna. And as a precondition, she has to do a language exam in German. So I'm teaching her online German. Uh, by the way, the exam is now next week. And, uh, and then I mentioned this point and she said, yeah, you know, in my language in Luganda, this is totally normal, we say that. So that means if you try and now imagine, Uganda has been a British colony and the lingua franca there is English. Now imagine how do people switch in their mind from the, the real native mother tongue where they can say such a thing in, in a grammar that is verb oriented how do you get into English where it's, where it's a subject oriented? So you have to change completely the mindset. You see, you see how, what colonialism does. And I think I mentioned this famous Kenyan uh, author, Ngubi Vationgo, who said, because of these observations, he does not write in English anymore. He became famous in his young years as an English, of course, colonial writer. And then at a certain point already well known and successfully decided to only write in Kikuyu and in, in Kiswahili because there he can express these things properly and he wants to write for an African audience. Yeah, so this is, this is exactly the, this, this, this point. I think it's super interesting and, uh, and well worth to be um, evaluated much more because it really expresses, I think, a lot of these political fights uh, that we have, especially with China, where it's the same story, the Chinese languages are verb oriented. So it is really difficult to get notions of, for example, uh, human rights into this language, because human rights are per se constructed on the idea of the subject. So if the grammar confirms all the time that there is a subject and the legal body is built on the idea of a subject, it is almost impossible to translate it into a verb-oriented language. But the world is nowadays small and we have to get along with each other. So we have to find ways to communicate that. So I think that's really a very serious challenge of our time. Yeah. So thank you very much also for, for your considerations. And uh, yeah, we are not done with that. We, we, we come back to that over and again. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. So uh, I yeah, think I we can start, Professor, because now uh, I think it's Thanksgiving in the US and different places and people are not attending, but it's, it's fine. We have the people who want to attend so we can start. And if they come and come in, we can let them join we as well. I would like to, wel to welcome a special guest with us, actually. Uh, he went to be, uh, he's a professor of uh, comparative religion, and he's sitting with me in the office. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know if you know. Yes. This is Professor <laughs> Schmidt is with me, Professor Wolfgang, and the PhD students. You have to do off the camera. Yeah, no, this doesn't have a camera. <laughs> we, we are having camera right here. Now I'm going to open the camera for another. Okay. Just a moment. OK. So he will be attending with us the session. Okay, welcome. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, so uh, I didn't know that we have US spies in this lecture. Uh, and they no, we have people from the US. And, and, and spies don't work at, at Thanksgiving. That's interesting. Yeah, and, uh, and a lot to stop the... Uh -huh, okay, so then while well, we do it with less people today, that should be fine. But I saw that Valet wanted to say something, or at least I saw his uh, his virtual hand. Is this still valid, Valet, or shall we start? Uh, yes, uh, I just wanted to uh, to make a comment uh, about uh, the word to peace. I yeah, think yeah. that. Uh, uh, necessity is uh, one of the main reasons of the uh, coinage or the creation of new forms of words 
And uh, I think that since this form is missing in English, it just means that uh, people don't really feel the necessity of uh, creating such such a verb. I mean, the verb to peace. So uh, this is somehow problematic, I think. Huh? Yeah. Uh, because uh, whenever we, we need uh, a new verb we create even if we want uh, if we, even if you start using a noun as a verb we, we, we see this every day especially with the with the new technologies uh, and so on and so forth so I think that the fact that we are missing such a verb the verb to peace means that we are still not uh, we haven't we still haven't reached that point uh, of uh, of creating peace and uh, that's my point of view mm -hmm. yeah okay thank you yes of course that is true uh, but i would say that you put it in a very i would say in a radical democratic way <laughs> you say when people need it they create it that and that's obviously true if it comes to correctly i mean i completely agree with you if it comes to the technology for example but in, in the case, if we look at the history of modernity, which is, again, sounds strange, the history of modernity, because the modern is always the most up to date and, and everything that was modern yesterday is already tradition. Uh, but if we have a closer look into the history of language, especially now modern language, and since this super smart idea of of Antonio de Nebricha to give language binding rules uh, that allow you to say whether you speak or write correctly or whether you make a mistake. Since then, we are used to this normative use of language. And I would say that, um, well, uh, that because of colonialism, that uh, big parts of the, of the world have by force unlearned to peace. So we, which means that, I mean, look at, 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 at areas like a whole continent like India, when you implement there English as the lingua franca and in a, in a culture where to peace is a totally natural thing, you impose on them a stinking structure of, uh, of of subjects, uh, you will you will change the country um, significantly, and this is the same. Uh, well, in in many places, uh, well, it happened in all of Africa. It happened in the Arabic world partly, and well, in all the places where colonialism uh, was real, and where we nowadays have at least one of the official languages of the country and a European language, and that's almost everywhere the case. So I think that this is a question of awareness. It's, I wouldn't say that we are not there yet. I rather would say we unlearned the use of the verb by force, by, by colonialism, yes. by imperialism. OK. Yes, I agree. Yeah, exactly. So this is yeah. A, yeah. And it's, now, a, it's a problem of awareness. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, yeah. it's, uh, okay. it's a better way to put my idea. Yes. Yeah. So, and that means that, well, uh, uh, one of the goals and aims uh, and reasons for having peace studies is that we get aware of these things so that we rediscover and, um, and uh, well, I would say, uncover these things and, uh, and make ourselves aware of them. And then we, we, we will struggle because we, we, our mind is not used to this kind of language. So it's really an interesting game to to play and to with that and to try it. Yeah. So therefore we, we make some such exercises. Thank you, Prost. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So then yet can we can I share the uh, you can in just a moment. Yeah, I think you can just let me no, check. I, can, I cannot yet. Okay, now we can. Now I can, yes. Okay. Okay, then we start and uh, yeah, so welcome everybody to the official part. And uh, we, uh, I told you last time, well, we will now jump a bit because we discussed already a lot of the modern 
notions of, uh, of peace, which is here a singular. And we also discussed partly already the, the postmodern notion. And therefore, I will very briefly now just go through some changes that happened in uh, modernity, again, in the European modernity, because European, uh, in modernity, per definition, is a European idea. Is, you don't find that in many other places. And, well, uh, I quote here a an, gentleman that probably is very well known to all of you, because this is now uh, the Friedrich Hölderlin is a, is a writer to whom the, the Jena Center refers strongly, and you can even find it on the web page as a, as a welcome address, so to say. I just want to refer on to, to that and ask from a peace studies point of view, what uh, can we do in peace studies with this reconciliation notion? So let us look at this famous sentence. I will not go deeper into that because I'm sure that Professor Leiner or Yad or Professor Wernke will later uh, quote that and, and discuss it extensively. Just a very short remark on that from my side. So the famous sentence that they are referring to is reconciliation is in the middle of strife and all that was separated finds each other. So what is this one sentence and one so crucial sentence from Hipparion? Uh, what does this tell us and what is remarkable here? If you look at that, you see that as early as 1797, Hölderlin puts his eye, and now I come back to what we just discussed before we officially started now. He looks at the conflict at the relational aspect of the conflict. So he does not say here, when he talks about reconciliation, he does not say anything once the perpetrator uh, has been punished or has asked for forgiveness or whatever, then we can have reconciliation. He does not ask for a recompensation of the victim or the families or whatever, the relatives of the weakness. But what he says is, it is in the middle of the strife and that all was separated finds each other. So in other words, if we look at that, what we see is that he thinks the world, without saying that explicitly, in an imminent way. You get it? So he, he, of course, in this time, there was no system theory, so he could not think in systems. And there was a philosophy or theology of immanence, but it was a minority program and not very popular. Um, this came from Spinoza from the Middle Ages when he understood, when he tried to turn from the personalized God to the idea of that divine uh, universe. This was always a minority program, very often considered to be heretic, and therefore people were even killed for thinking that way. And now we see that in a very, uh, how shall I say, in a very timid way in the sentence of uh, Hölderlin, of course, in a very uh, interesting moment of world history. If you look at these years, you know we are now in the French Revolution. So this is where it takes place. Uh, we know that Goethe was not enthusiastic about that, and he even thought that, uh, that Hölderlin is, is, is nuts. Later, Goethe became one of the four thinkers of immanent worldview. But this is, uh, many of us have to go through developments, and this is even the famous Goethe had to do so. So now I just quote again from the, from the webpage of, uh, of, of the Jena Center, in antithesis to a widespread notion in political science, where reconciliation is seen as an 
uh, event that uh, occurs only after the end of the current conflict, the Hölderlin perspective pays attention to those elements of a conflict that speak for and potentially lead towards reconciliation. So that means, in other words, that the word reconciliation is in itself an, an immanent notion. So because reconciliation happens, well, in the, we, we discussed that last time, etymologically, yes, between the human and the divine sphere. So we needed an, a shaman and, and, and a prophet who reconciles these spheres, yes. But now in the mundane sphere, we have reconciliation, <coughs> sorry, reconciliation, between and among human beings. This is what Hölderlin, who was uh, considered to be a little bit crazy or more than a little bit crazy. So this is what he proposes out of time. Yeah, this is not the mainstream of the thought in his, in his time. But let's look at 10 years later. Now I come to Hegel, the famous philosopher, one of the leading philosophers, and in his book, 10 years after, uh, after Hölderlin, in the phenomenology of the mind or the spirit, what you prefer, I personally prefer the translation uh, mind, because it, you can translate the German word Geist with both. There are some translations saying mind, some say spirit, I prefer mind. Now, what does he say there? He says, and now this is really interesting, only by a reconciling yes, a perpetrator and the victim can recognize each other and escape from the infinite, uh, what does it mean now that I cannot see that, uh, the infinite law of justice in the sense of revenge and retaliation. So remember what we discussed last time uh, about justice. What did we say? We said, well, after this diagram and the long discussion on that, in the end, we have a turning wheel because justice says in itself, in a vectoral chronosophy, that we seek revenge. Something has happened in the past and now I want revenge just by saying justice. And then we have the greed and the envy argument. And when we are successful, our opponent will ask for justice because my justice is the injustice of the other and we turn the wheel. And we said, especially in the uh, area that is of interesting for you, for most of you. So in the Middle East, we can see that for more than 2000 years, this turning wheel. And this is, uh, well, first of all, interesting, but what now, Hegel brings in is this new word. This is the reconciling yes. And with the help of this reconciling yes, we can escape from the turning wheel. Because by that, we do not need revenge and retaliation in order to have justice. But how can we get there? By turning away from the idea of the perpetrator and the victim as individuals and with a focus on their relation and the unsuccessful, the unbalanced aspects of this relation. So in, instead of revenge, we try to balance, we try to, uh, to create harmony and this stops the turning wheel of revenge. So we get to a totally different understanding of justice. And this is important because I told you last time, I don't want to let you go with this idea that justice is something bad. This is not what I said. And you will see that we need justice for peace and also for all the interpretations of peace, justice is always needed. The question is how do we deal with justice and how do we think justice and how do we live justice? So, and here comes a very interesting invitation, I would say, from a philosopher. It says, let's focus on the relation and not on the individuals who are involved or not, not to give them priority. And then, well, this is now again 
uh, a very a very Hegelian uh, wording here. He says further, when we do that, the wounds of the spirit uh, will heal and no scars remain. Now you see that I spelled spirit with a capital and I don't know how familiar you are with, with Hegel. Uh, if you do that, you refer to what he calls, uh, calls in, in, in German, the Weltgeist. So now how do you translate that? We are again in the translation problem. Uh, what most people decided is to call it the spirit, but with capital different from the individual spirit. So we have to the same word has a different meaning with a capital or with, a, um, with the, in, in the individual sense. So this is what he says. And now what, again, uh, we have to be clear that Hegel did not have system theory uh, at his disposal. So what does he say? What is this spirit, this Weltgeist? It is, in a broader sense, again, an expression of immanence because this spirit is the spirit of the universe. It's the, of the world, of all existence. So it's again the same idea. So without saying that explicitly, he refers to an immanent concept and says in an immanent concept, if we understand it, all the atrocities, all the things that uh, the Professor Leiner quoted in his, in his uh, lecture, in his first lecture, all of that can heal if we understand it as such. So that's, and of course, it's a philosophical proposal. That's not the truth. This is a proposal, but it's an interesting one, I guess. So then he says the deed is not everlasting, but the spirit takes it back to itself. And this is now very important. The deed is not everlasting. If it is possible to heal a relation, we do not have to forget because reconciliation is not forgetting. It's not something horrible happened and we don't speak about it anymore. So this was very much discussed since I'm a German native speaker. Uh, we know that the generation that witnessed and, and survived the, the Second World War, the German speakers, I'm talking about the generation like my, my grandparents who were soldiers in the, in the Nazi army, they preferred not to talk after the war. So many families, many people of my age can tell you that their grandparents and partly their parents, they preferred not to talk about their uh, war experiences. Uh, and forgetting that, of course, is not reconciliation. If you don't speak about Auschwitz, it does not mean that you get an, um, a healing relation with between the surviving perpetrators and the surviving victims. It, it takes much more. So reconciliation is much more than forgetting. And just as a footnote, since we are in this particular uh, uh, lecture, uh, does anybody know this picture that I have hidden here now for you? This on the left side. Any hand? Anybody knows what that is? I don't see hands, so I will tell you. Uh, well, this is the meeting of Emperor Napoleon and Friedrich Hegel. And you know where they met, where this happens. Maybe you, <laughs> I could say, maybe Iati, maybe you know the house, <laughs> I could ask, because that is in Vienna. Jena or Weimar? No, this is Jena. Jena, okay, yeah. Yeah, so this is uh, this day met in Jena and, and Hegel wrote after that about his impressions with uh, of this meeting. And of course, here's an illustration of that. So, I mean, this is uh, when we talk about these things and, and, and this just organized by the Jena Center and the University of Jena, it's pretty clear that these things really refer strongly to them. And therefore, again, I will leave further elaborations on that to Professor Leiner and Bramke. And to Yata, I don't know what exactly is prepared, but uh, I think this is your your topic. So now, um, if we since we since we are here, and then I will jump very with these big steps to to the uh, current times. I just want to discuss uh, again a little bit of etymology and uh, make clear that if we talk now about 
peace out of justice and make reconciliation a keyword, we have to be clear uh, what, uh, what we are talking about when we use everyday words in the context of reconciliation. Reconciliation has a lot to do with forgiveness or with excusing. Clearly, yeah. So, but what does this mean now and in our frame? We have two words etymologically that go and again are used in most of the European uh, languages for this notion, but they are very different. So uh, to forgive, in German we have for the German speakers vergebung, the word vergeben, is forgive, to forgive in English or in uh, French, pardon or pardonner. And this goes back to the Latin uh, perdonare. And here, perdonare is composed, it's exactly the same notion as we have it, it is forgiving. And this refers from its beginning, from its, from, its, from its roots, to a higher authority. So to forgive is in the hands of, well, since we are here mainly Christians and, and Muslims, we can say of God. So this word refers to God. The forgiver is God. And the whole mission of God in, 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 is forgiving because we, the human beings, we fail constantly, we sin constantly, and God has to forgive us. If you secularize this meaning of the word, you still need an authority. So if it is not God, the transcendent God anymore, then we have a, a ruler, an authority in the human sphere that goes into the same position. So a king. Uh, an emperor, however you call the people, they are the authorities that forgive those who made mistakes, the, the sinners in the, in the mundane sphere. This is what uh, forgiving means. Nowadays, because of the developments of the 20th century, we are not so careful with this use anymore. And you would even ask, I don't know, your, your partner, your, your friend, for forgiveness, which is not really logical, etymologically spoken. Because this is the other word, which is in its core, ex Latin excuso, which means no cause. This is now the translation into German for Verzeihung. Uh, and uh, well, in English, excuse, and then all the in all the other languages, the, the parallel words for that. This is there, nothing remains. This is uh, no, the X means no, means gone, and the cusus stands for cause. So no cause, that means this is something that we can tell each other on the same level. So you, well, you know, the everyday things, you stepped on my, on my toes and uh, you say, excuse me. And uh, yeah, so it's no cause, there's nothing, nothing remains, yeah. So, and I'm as a human being and you as a human being, we are authorized to do that to each other. So we have two different roots uh, for something that we uh, nowadays use almost synonymous. I, I think you, you probably in everyday situation, you will not uh, think carefully, shall I say, pardon now, or forgive me, or excuse me. But it is, it has in its root a very different notion. And here it is, this is relevant for us because since we distinguish constantly between an immanent and a transcendent worldview, we can clearly say that excuse belongs to the immanent because this is the human sphere. We can only move and live in the human sphere. So excuse belongs to us, whereas the uh, forgiveness belongs to a transcendent worldview. So here, I think in our context, it's well worth to be aware of that. Okay, 
Good. So this is um, what I what I wanted to um, but stress here because these words are closely related to reconciliation, and then we see that reconciliation is closely related to justice. That means the way how we live justice, if we are able to excuse, is in our hands. So excuse is also a democratic concept, whereas forgiveness is an authoritarian concept. Yeah, so the justice that we make is in our hands, if we think imminently, the justice that we receive is in a higher authority's hands, if we think in a transcendent way. So that's, that's important for the further considerations, okay? Good, then this one we have already seen, but now I want to uh, guide you quickly through this developments uh, of these thoughts in, um, in modern European uh, philosophy. Uh, we jump now 100 years more or less to Friedrich Nietzsche, a little bit less than 100 years, and to this, uh, to this observation, uh, his observation, there are no objects, no facts, but only interpretations. So of course, this is another step closer to an imminent worldview uh, as it took place then in the 20th century, in especially with the phenomenology of uh, Husserl, of Edmund Husserl, and then later in the philosophy of Heidegger, and finally in the French schools of postmodern thought. And this is where we go at the moment. Okay, if it is too fast, please stop me, yeah, because this is, I know this is an enormous jump now, and we go really through. Uh, I don't know, hundred thousands of pages of very relevant philosophy. Uh, but this is the main point. We discussed that already earlier. So, and then we end up in post-modernity after the Second World War uh, and this proposal of the many pieces. Oh, what happened now? Yeah. Uh, the many pieces. Uh, the that means the plural that had to be rediscovered by these postmodern philosophers as an answer to the postmodern condition. So remember what we said, postmodern condition is the doubt of societies in the achievements uh, of modern politics and philosophy and thoughts in general. So they don't believe the promises of modernity anymore because of Hiroshima, because of Auschwitz and so on. So the people still live under modern conditions, but they don't believe anymore. That was the condition. Yeah, These people who have to get up in the morning in spite of uh, Hiroshima, and they have to take their children to school, and they have to prepare breakfast and so on. So that, that was what we had. And now the attempt to find a philosophical answer, to find an intellectual way out of this dilemma is postmodernism, is the postmodern uh, cognition, as uh, Joffre Svalier called it. So how do we think? And now these, these things that we just discussed before become super relevant. We turn away from this idea that a human individual is a subject that creates and does everything and is responsible for everything, but we begin to understand the human being as an element of a living system that yes can, with everything that he or she does individually, influence the movement of the system, but there is nobody in the system who can take the lead and decide in which direction the system moves. So this also goes, of course, now for nowadays, we have uh, big names in politics and they seem to be super powerful, but in the end, not Mr. Biden and not Mr. Putin and whatever the names are, decide where the system, human, humanity moves, but they just influence it. And of course, they may be a little, little bit stronger than somebody who is just a, a plumber or a carpenter, 
but in the end, everybody can influence the movement of the system. I can do it, you can do it, and nobody can decide where it goes. So this is this new immanent understanding that goes hand in hand with system theory. System theory comes from biology and zoology and understands the human society as very similar to the societies that we know from the different animals. And at the same time, we get this philosophical notion of immanence, which is crucial now here. And from that is, and I will not repeat that anymore, you know that in this atmosphere of this not believing anymore in the promises of modernity, uh, still having to lift every day up to its standards and looking for alternatives. This is the, the atmosphere where peace studies has been created in the late 50s and then in first steps throughout the 60s and then more strongly since the 70s. That's, the, that's how peace studies came into existence. We have done that. I just repeat it here in order to to connect the different streams of the lecture. Okay, yes, so much. This is, uh, is everybody happy now with, well, not happy maybe, but uh, everybody clear with this postmodernity. This is how, why postmodern pieces are a plural, because now the new thing is turn away from the just a mere individual approach to a relational approach. That's the main point of modernity right any doubts still any any and is anybody does anybody feel lost because if not we will do the next step well it is okay this is what i see let me see the minute i look at the dilemma okay so i don't see any protest that means i can continue is this correct you can continue professor okay. Okay, good. So if so, maybe we will see how this works technically. I miss, with this slide, we, we go now into transrationality, next chapter. And uh, at the last chapter of this journey yeah, that will take us then in the end to more applied and more hands-on practical things. So, but now I have to play a game with you and uh, we have to be very, uh, yeah, we will use the chat, I think. Um, yeah, this is so far so good. That's nice. So let's use the chat. I will show you something now, and I will ask you what it is. What do you see? Please write it, because otherwise we get a disaster with the microphones. Uh, so please write it into the chat. What do you see? Uh, what will appear now on the screen? Please write it down. Okay, so what do you see? Ah, this was too fast, sorry. What do you see? Okay, everybody, please. I don't believe you yet, you are kidding. Uh -huh. Okay. Any, anybody else uh, doesn't move anymore? Has everybody expressed his or her idea? Okay, so I, I think that a shark was a, was a joke and a whale probably a two. I mean, I, 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 I don't know how you see a whale here or a shark, but what most people wrote is a wave or yes, water or well, the ocean, I guess you could only write because you saw you saw the my, because of my mistake. Now the whole picture. So what most people well agree on, I think it's easy to agree that this is a wave. And if everybody who said a wave is well, okay, let's say, well, I, I don't judge, no. Everybody who said that this is a wave, I would say propose that we interrupt the lecture now for let's say 12 hours. And I send you out and ask you, please, could you find this wave? If this is a wave, 
then please leave your room and, and find this way. How many of you, again, maybe in the chat, so who wants to leave the room and uh, and find this wave in, in reality? I don't see any movement in the chat, so no, nobody leaves the, the lecture now. The first one, uh, the first one who finds this wave will get thousand euro from me. Nobody wants to leave the room, not me. Okay. Okay, so why don't you want to leave the room? Because you were not accurate in your statement. Because what you see in front of you, I know for sure, is not a wave. What you see in front of you is, in the best of all cases, the picture of a wave. And since it is a picture, a photo of a wave, you know, without thinking further uh, about it, that this wave cannot be found in real life. So why? Because if it is a photo, it definitely has taken something from the past. And the wave is a dynamic thing that moves constantly. So whenever this photo was taken, this wave cannot be found in these uh, guys in this shape anymore. That's what all of you know, and therefore you don't leave. Yeah? And you don't want to run around in your countries, on the beaches of your countries, and, and look for waves that may look like this one. So that's what is what we know. So the more accurate statement would be, it is a photo of a wave. And then if we go even further, if you are very strict, you would say, OK, who says that this is a wave? Well, you say, your experience says that, but what you really see is just some colored dots in front of your eyes on the screen. That's all. Your mind makes it a wave. And this is where I want to go. Your mind identifies, very important verb, your mind identifies a wave. And this wave does not have an identity. It's just identified. So, and now, now this doesn't work anymore. So now we, I show you this picture, which is, which is, by the way, has been taken in Spain. So in, somewhere in the close to Valencia in, in Spain. So now you see the whole picture. Well, at least everything that the camera could get. If we talk about the identity of the wave that you have identified before, can you precisely tell me where this wave begins and where it ends? In this dynamics of the ocean, does this wave have a very clear cut identity? And I guess, yeah, well, I have to look at the chats again. I want to know the real picture, can't wait. OK, no, so you cannot. OK, yes. So that's exactly the point. So nobody can really say exactly where this wave begins, where this wave ends. We still see a wave. And now if you imagine the real life, this would be dynamic, this would move. And your eyes have to identify the same wave if they follow this wave. They have to, to, to follow constantly until it breaks at the shore and then um, well disappears as this individual that you identify, but still is there because all the parts of this wave remain on the place and just reunite and integrate into other waves. And what we see as a particularity of this wave is that it is only real to us because the other waves exist. You cannot tell this wave from another wave because they are so clearly interrelated that the whole movement creates the wave and dissolves the wave. 
So this wave can say, or if it could speak, it would say, I am to the neighbor, I am because you are. You cannot take in this, this was I did with the photo, you cannot do that in reality. You cannot cut a wave out of this of the um, surrounding world and just keep it and take it home and keep it in your your armor as a memory of this beautiful holiday. That doesn't work. So this is what the ocean, just when you stand at the shore and watch the waves, what they teach you. This is something that you can see, what you can feel, what you can get from nature. So, and now, is everybody with me still? Or are there any doubts or? No, I don't see doubts. So then I continue. Now, the next, the next exercise. Where does it work? Ah, okay. So first, okay, this is what I said. We have to differentiate between identity and identification, meaning the same and making the same. So the same is not an objective same, but it is made the same by our mind. We see something, we have all learned what a wave is, so when something looks like that, we make it a wave. In Latin, the difference between idem and facere idem, identification is just exactly that. It is the translation. This facere comes as fication. So making the same. And now the next exercise. Question, what do you see now? Please write it into your, the chat. What do you what do you see on the screen now? Okay. Yeah. More. I just have two proposals. Anybody else, please? Okay, good. Okay, yeah. So, yeah. So, some say a face, a face of a child, a face of a boy, whatever. Yeah. So, that's, that's of course, what our mind simply tells us. And this is how we take that. Now, after all that we have said, it is pretty clear that this is not a child, but this is the face, the picture of a child, the picture of a face of a child. Yeah. So, and of course, yes, I, I placed it here in the ocean because I want to invite you to think the same structure that we had with the water now for the human sphere. So the same what we had before as the picture of a wave. Now we have a picture of a child and I tell you the child is a boy. Okay. So if we now repeat the exercise and I tell you, please go and find this boy. How many of you will leave the room and will say, okay, I will be the first one. Again, the reward is 1,000 euro. So the first one who can find this boy uh, will get 1,000 euro. Who leaves? <coughs> yeah. So I see somebody. I can, I can without you. That's a lot of money. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, but uh, only if you find this boy. So, and well, the, the, the clue here is simply that you cannot find this boy for the same reason that you could not find the wave before, because this is the picture of a boy and not a boy. So if you try, what you know for sure is that the picture, since it is a picture, it must have been taken in the past and this boy has grown since then because the boy is alive. The boy is a living being. That means each second of the day uh, since this picture has been taken, this boy changed. And it, you will have a hard time or not a hard time, but it's impossible to find the one that you see in this picture. 
And I show you a more recent picture of the same boy. This doesn't work anymore. Come on. Yeah. So that's a more recent picture of this boy. But even if I tell you now, go and find this gentleman, and everybody, I guess that everybody identifies this gentleman, you will not find the one on this picture anymore because since then, when that picture was taken, he again has changed. So we change constantly. You can never find anybody who is in a picture. You can only identify somebody in a picture, which means that you make it and or him or her the same or it, of course, if it's a wave. Clear, yes, I think so far you are with me. If we now replace the picture of the Dalai Lama with your own picture, you will have, I think, a harder time. I guess that all of you had this experience that you were sitting in your living room and you had maybe an album of your photos from your childhood and you tell your best friend, look, that's me in, I don't know, in, in 1990. And of course, this is on the one hand, everybody knows what you mean and no problem in conventional language, but uh, it is not really accurate because that's not you. That's a picture of you and this is not you anymore. And if you travel with your passport and you have there a number and a picture and the birth, uh, birth date and so on, I mean, this passport is never you. It's just a paper that identifies you. That's your identification, but it's not you. So important for that is if it comes to the question of peace, of reconciliation, and excuse, and pardon, or uh, forgiveness, we have to be aware that identity is what I think now that I have been once. So if we go into these identity discourses, it has to be clear that we are not one and the same from birth to death in an essentialist sense, but that life makes us change constantly like waves in an ocean. And when I say I am, in my case, the Wolfgang who has been here, born here in this village and pa 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 pa, this is an identification. This is not the truth. And important for peace and conflict work is that because of that uh, fact that we identify and are not ident, we always are free to rethink our identification. So we can let things go anyway, because the past, as we have said before, is always a story. So that's a very important thing. It is very simple in the end. Um, it is more than as another person, Professor. Okay. Well, now I, I think I lost part of the chat. <laughs> okay, no, it's not me. Uh, sadly, I can find him correct using technology, even then not. It, you can find, yeah, in Google Pictures, probably. Yeah, I mean, I took it from Google Pictures, so actually you can find it there. But then you just find the same, the same picture. And what we get is uh, colored dots uh, as impulses on our eyes. And our eyes send uh, information to the, to the brain. And the brain uh, uses what it has learned. And the mind makes, gives it a meaning and says, that's the Dalai Lama. Yeah, so that's exactly uh, what happens. Yeah, so this is a really crucial thing. Um, now, I don't know what happened here. It doesn't work anymore. Okay. So now uh, let us just uh, have a closer look uh, on the function of our brain with the help of uh, uh, this um, beautiful gentleman, Antonio Damasio. So what he says, there is no single place. Well, he's yeah, maybe I have to, ex uh, to explain. He's from Portugal, and he's a, a very famous neuroscientist who wrote in the 90s of the last century, more than 25 years ago, a book called Descartes' Arrow. 
So he turned as from a neuroscientific point of view strongly against this idea of the stable individual. So I'm going with, uh, with his writings now and just introduce them briefly to you. So what he wrote 25 years ago, there is no single place in the brain where an individual command center, center, a coordinator or seat of the self can be located. So he turns against Descartes' idea of the homunculus, of this little ego center in the brain that tells us what we have to do. So this fantasy of Descartes about the uh, eternal free soul. So this, this transfer from the religious concept into the scientific concept. He turns against that with the means of science. So this is very, very crude, very, very strict um, uh, natural science. And he says, well, from all the studies about the human brain, what we know for sure, there is no single place in the brain where an individual command center can be located. There is no self-center in the brain. This does not exist. Thoughts and feelings are synchronizing and coherent responses of various distributed but related and selected neurons in the brain to external, not auto-created impulses, group dischargement. So what happens is we see colored dots. Our eyes are the instruments that are able to receive that. So they receive this impulse, they send it to the brain. And in, this, in the brain, we have this uh, interrelated neurons now discharging. And this comes to the mind as a notion. For example, Dalai Lama. Yeah, this is what happens, but there is no self sitting there individually identifying these things. The related neurons are simultaneously, and now very important, senders, processors, and receivers, because what the neurons then do, what the brain does with its function is not only receiving and identifying, but it also has a function to what now? So reacting to the impulse and then sending the command to the whole physical system and make it do something. So this can be, the, the, the conclusion can be very different. It can be run away. So probably the command is to the, to the legs, please run. Or it can be shake hands or it can be look to the ground or well whatever yeah? so run after the ball whatever you, you, you it is yeah so the this is how it works and this is what we are we have the brain as a processing thing and not as a stable identity like waves in the water so the brain is a processing organ a tool and not the seed of an of identity, but a permanent identity maker and identifier. And we know now neurogenesis tells us the brain produces new, new neurons until the last moment of life. That means even when we die, we have to learn dying. This is a new experience. And therefore, the brain produces neurons that are able to accompany the dying process. Even in dying, this is the case. Now, imagine if it is just meeting somebody um, unknown until then, or doing an activity for the first time, and so on. So learning produces enormously neuro, uh, neurons. And from that follows neuroplasticity, which is that the brain responses to experience and training, and it changes in neural, neural pathways and synapses. In other words, even the physical shape of our brain depends on the experiences and the trainings that we go through. So the experience make us and not the inverse. And we can influence that 
by the trainings that we choose to do. So that's uh, not new anymore. I mean, these studies began in the 50s, also parallel, timely parallel to, to peace studies. And the, 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 these findings are clear, are very well um, uh, published and, and can be checked and so on. The interesting point is here that social science isn't too, too much, doing too much with it because the consequences for social science are revolutionary. Social science is built on the presumption of the individual. And what we can learn from that is that we are not in that sense individuals. You cannot cut an individual human being out of the humankind as little or as, as impossible as cutting a brain, uh, a wave out of an ocean. Uh, Iyad, you wanted to add something to uh, see that correctly? Yes, uh, I wrote in the chat, uh, neural network. So what you are saying, actually, we do it in AI, in artificial intelligence. So now they are doing it and using the past to uh, comparing to the future, to the present, to predict the future. So they're using exactly what the, this philosopher said and applying it in neural network. So now okay. that's what the AI is doing. It's exactly uh, where the social sciences became more important than any other sciences, because with social sciences, now you can predict the future. Doing AI by taking the past and comparing it to, it to the present, this is what the computer does, this is what the AI does, and then he collects the whole, the most collection, collecting of the same identity of the same thing, he, he will get to what will happen in the future, according to that, that's the statistical way. I, pray. I just wanted to add this, it's very interesting. Yeah, thank you very much. And of course, it's based on this natural side, because uh, Damasio is not, is not a philosopher, he's a neuroscientist, so he's a hardcore scientist. Yeah, this is, of course, the consequences are philosophical, because it breaks with a long tradition of, uh, of, 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 of philosophy. So many of the ideas, specifically in the Cartesian tradition, simply turn out to be wrong because you cannot uh, go with Cartesian philosophy uh, based on the knowledge that we have since the, however you want to count it, since the 1950s or latest since the 1990s. So with this knowledge, it is absolutely clear that this that that identity functions in a different way identity is is because it's identified and it's not pre-given yeah so that's that's super important and this of course has consequences in all sciences as i said in social science crucial because i mean from here this has to do with the question what is a citizen or imagine the consequences for law yeah, constitutional rights, but even more than panel rights. So who is a perpetrator? Yeah, I mean, we have still, we, we, I mean, we have now very human uh, panel laws compared to, to previous times, but still it is uh, based on the presumption that the perpetrator is an individual who is 100% responsible for the deeds and the deeds are done because the doer invented them or created them made them. And we see from these neuroscientific results that this is not, that not true. We are in the, embedded in society as much as waves in oceans. And we are, because the others are, we move each other and the, the emergence of an individual that we perceive with the human senses as an individual is a more complex um, um, uh, dynamic process, then, uh, then the, the presumption was there until um, these studies uh, have been published. So this is really crucial. And well, now we cannot, we the peace researchers, we cannot change uh, all so, uh, social sciences, but what we can do is we can understand that for our own core topic, because from that follows a lot of consequence for uh, for peace research. So what is peace? This has to be answered in a different way, knowing these things. So now again. 
So since there is uh, no convergent center in the brain, representations of cognitive contents may consist of the coordinated activity of large numbers of neurons, so far so clear, that may be distributed across many different areas of the cerebral context. Yeah, well, this is... Okay, now in the, 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 as a consequence, experience and joyful training produce new neural pathways and synapses. This is what we already said before, but now take, take this into the context of university studies. If we know that question, why do universities still function didactically uh, very similar to 300 years ago? Because the idea of a human being was dramatically different 300 years ago uh, compared to that. So that means now that even in academic learning, and of course the same applies to kindergarten and to, to primary schools, but now our world here is the universities, that even the didactics, this goes to the architecture of university buildings have to be revised whether they respond in a proper way to these uh, findings, because what we need as academic learning is a joyful training. Why do I uh, emphasize joyful? Because the human nature, the human being wants to learn. Learning, the experience of learning, learning is understanding something intellectually, then playing with the understood, applying it, and finally, uh, discovering the relevance of this learned thing for the further life. And this is what we want to do. We, the human beings, we long for that. So that's a very, a, a very, a very crucial thing. And then this means if we have learning institutions, they have to be organized around this insight, which is very different to the competitive notions that contemporary universities usually offer. The question is not who is the best, who is the smartest, who is the strongest, who is the fastest, but the question is, uh, well, how can we enjoy learning because this will give the best result. For the brain joyful homeostatic learning process equal peace. So that means we go so far in our approach that we say, learning is, if it can happen unhampered, it is peace, it equals peace. Yeah, this is what I just said. Okay, and then of course, very crucial again, another finding of the 19th, 1990s uh, is this existence of the mirror neurons. They have been discovered relatively late and they simply, uh, what they do is they connect brains and they make us doing similar things. I'm not sure, I think I mentioned that already. No, I did not mention that here. I, if I do so, please stop me if I did already. So this goes, for example, to the, to the simple observation. When a mother feel, feeds a baby after breastfeeding and when it starts to, to teach the baby how to eat, what you usually is you have the spoon in your hands and then you bring some food to the lips of the child and you want the child to open the mouth. So what is the mother doing? If you, if you imagine this, what usually happens, or if you observe yourself, I don't know how many mothers or fathers are among you. It's, this is not a gender thing. Uh, the, uh, the, main, the main thing is that we automatically open our mouth. So I want the baby to eat and I open the mouth. And what happens is that the baby opens the mouth. This is because we function that way, that this connection happens. And this is how we do. And the interesting point is that even if I don't want consciously to teach the baby, even then I will do it. So because the connection of the two relates them and makes them do similar things. And this goes, of course, for many, uh, for, for many different uh, uh, fields. Uh, this can be used, for example, 
uh, let's say in a, in a funny way, if you have a concert and uh, thousands of people are jumping in the same in the same way, this is why do we that? Because we enjoy it so much. Yeah, we are in this case like animals. There's no meaning in, in behind jumping together, but we do it and we jump in the same rhythm. Yeah, and of course you can also use it for for structuring people, for organizing people. This is well known in the army. So why do soldiers march? What is the purpose of that? Because by doing that, by synchronizing the movements, you really make them one body. So this has been long before the, uh, the mirror neurons and the neuroplasticity have been discovered even that uh, the, the officers, the trainers in the armies were very aware of this effect. Uh, so the, the knowledge as such is old, we now have just another language for expressing that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so if you are still with me, now we re I really want to underline this immanent approach to peace, the immanent worldview that is necessarily for transrational pieces. And I think it's the easiest way to do that is by quoting a letter uh, written by uh, Albert Einstein in 1951 to a close friend whose son had died. So it's a condolence letter that Albert Einstein wrote personally to a friend. So this is not from an academic writing, it's a personal letter. Yeah, and what he said there, I think is really uh, electrifying. So he wrote to his friend, a human being is part of the whole called by us universe in a part limited in time and space. He, this is 1951, so he was not gender sensitive and the dead one was a son and the friend was a male, so no gender question here. But of course you could also put she if you like. So he experiences himself, his thoughts and feeling as something separate from the rest, a kind of delusion of his consciousness, an optical delusion of his consciousness. Now it works, okay. This, he continues, this delusion is kind of a prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for uh, a group of person nearest to us. And now the point, the conclusion. Our tasks must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening the circle of compassion, to embrace living creatures, look at the word here, living creatures, and the whole nature uh, in its being. So what does this mean? Our tasks must be to free ourselves from the prison, from this prison, by widening the circle of compassion and to embrace all living creatures and the whole nature. What does this mean? What he says here, he the probably outstanding uh, brain of the 20th century is that the idea of the individual is this prison because it's a misconcept of reality and we, he does not say we have to do away our, our give away our love for our, in this case, the son or the family or what so on. But he says we have to widen the circle of compassion for all living beings. This is what a Mahayana Buddhist would say. So the compassion for all living beings. He said, calls them living creatures here now. And the whole nature. So this is basically the same. Yeah. So. The point is that everything is connected. Everything is because the other is, and only because of the limitation of our human senses, we perceive the smaller things in this reduced way. And he invites us to widen our perception. This is, this is revolutionary. Again, it's a private, uh, letter and still this is really the, the message. 
So, and therefore, now if you take, if you put that into uh, more scientific terms and away from the private context, we come to the axioms of transrational pieces. First, the universe is an interwoven net of connectivity, saying there are no human islands in reality. Every human being is related to all the others in a way, and not only to the human sphere, but also to all existence, even to not living uh, realities, to stones and rocks and whatever. There are no things. This is again things meaning like the once individual wave. This wave does as such not exist, even if we perceive it. But networks and interrelations, we have to understand all individual things as networks and interrelations. And this gives us, of course, a different understanding of peace and of uh, well, the, our, our topics like reconciliation, forgiveness, uh, excuse. In nature, there exists no stable structures. Like again, the same, the wave is so useful here. Yeah? So you cannot freeze an ocean and just say, that's it forever. And now we have all the individual waves in the frozen way. No, it's constantly, as long as there is life, that it is dynamically oscillating and everything changes constantly and human beings change as much as waves in the ocean do it. And pieces then, now it's very clear in the, such a context, you cannot have the one and only piece, the piece. You can only have a momentary piece, a situative, a relational piece, but this a piece changes each moment, even if you don't get any new actors into the scene between the same human actors, a piece changes constantly and becomes another one because in the transcurse of time, we ourselves are changing. And with us as individuals, also as our relations change uh, continuously. And therefore, we have to regard this dynamic nature of human existence. And we see that this idea of the one piece that freezes the human reality in an essence is per, by itself violent because it is nothing but an imagination, sometimes even sold in very sweet words like the paradise on earth or similar things. And as soon as we imagine a constant paradise at the end of history, we want to get out of history. But the only reality that we have is this moment of history, uh, for example, now and now and now. So this is, this is the observation of, of Einstein, which is extremely important for the further understanding of uh, transrationality. So, and Descartes, error is very clear now that we, many of the dualities that are constitutive for modernity can no longer be upheld. This is most of all mind and matter, or I could also say body and mind. This is the understanding with the Damasio, for example, you understand that the mind is a function of the brain. And the brain is nothing but another organ of the human body. The brain is in its composition of cells, not too different from a stomach or, uh, or the heart or, or the liver or the kidneys or whatever. It is just a composition of cells, of course, very complex, yes. But in the end, it is body. And therefore, the mind activity is a production of the body. And it is not that the eternal soul uh, travels uh, through the mundane spheres uh, in the body and leaves it later. And this is even if a sophisticated modern uh, narration on that, like the mind does not change this, this fact. Therefore, you can also not distinguish between observer and observed, because according to uh, the Einstein, they are naturally related. 
So there's always a relation between observer and observed. And what we can do, we can try to be aware of the kind of relation, but it is not separated. So if I observe a fox, I'm related to the fox. We are part of the same ocean. We are two waves in the same ocean and therefore interrelated. And very important for the modern mind here is now that you cannot distinguish between culture and nature because this is a was mainly a Cartesian idea. You know that nature is everything that is pre-given and culture is all the noble activity of the human mind. This cannot be upheld any longer because the human being is nature. So we are not different to nature. We cannot separate ourselves from nature. As we already said, I mean, you can observe yourself how you breathe while we are in this class and you will also breathe after this class. And you did it already before. So meaning that with breathing, we are naturally interrelated with all the surrounding world. And there are many more human activities that necessarily connect us and make us the same. Very obvious if we eat, for example, I mean, how would you say there is the egg? that I'm going to eat, it is a separated subject. And when does it stop being separate? In the moment that it touches my lips or when I start to chew it with my teeth or when I swallow it or when my stomach starts to process it or when and how do you separate the egg from the self in the end at all? So that means that we are integrated into the O1 and uh, this, all the, the ideas of separation are uh, illusions, are misconceptions of the reality. So we cannot speak about nature without speaking about ourselves. All these uh, interesting researches that we are doing on nature are in reality uh, studies of our self. So invitation to Mr. Descartes to replace this idea of the individual homunculus uh, by an understanding of the network of all existence, as Einstein said. And then it is, I think, quite important because now I come back to the short discussion that we had before, um, our, before we started officially. Uh, this is that, uh, well, here for it, it is this, I think the picture is very well known, I guess that all of you know it. And what it stands for is Ubuntu, which is a South African notion that became very well known in, uh, in, the, in, in the transcourse of the processes and uh, after apartheid, because it transported far beyond the, the, the borders of South Africa, uh, this idea that I am because we are. So that this is an understanding of the not European people uh, who live, for example, now in this case, on this spot, and they don't have this notion of the individual beyond the community. I can only perceive myself, understand myself uh, as a member of this community. I am because the community is. And this creates, of course, a lot of problems if it comes to the question of human rights, because the human rights are built on, uh, based on the idea of the European idea of the individual. And it's very difficult to transfer that into a world where people, where members of a community or of a society say, I am because we are. But this is abundant beyond the European cultures. This is, can be found on all continents, and I'm talking about the, our days today, and not just only about history, what has existed once, once a time, upon in the time. Okay, so this is, we see that, so that means we have many narrations on the same obser ob, uh, observation. Well, Einstein is an outstanding intellectual who was able to put it into these words, but it's not so special. It is that many people who are usually not uh, celebrated as, as so famous thinkers, they also know that they understand it and they live accordingly. Because what you also get from 
uh, such an observation, such an, an, an identification of the human is, of course, a different way to treat the surrounding world, that is the nature. Yeah? So you, we embed our own humankind in a different way into nature with such an understanding, um, and if not with the, an individual identification. Yeah. So, and now what do we take from that? Um, I see we are already. Yeah, can we have a coffee break, Professor? This, uh, who spoke so much? I don't know. You don't know who spoke so much? No, and someone <laughs> yeah. wrote a lot. <laughs> yeah, okay, good. Yeah. So then, yeah, I, I think it's time for a break. I'm astonished. I thought I just started. Yeah, but uh, it was uh, very interesting, to be honest with you, Professor. Very, very interesting about the philosophy okay. and the applied transitional piece is exactly a very interesting. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, then, uh, then still, let's have a coffee break. Yes. Uh, the, the famous ten minutes until. Yeah. Well, yeah. 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 Let's say, let's say for let's say forty five and we. Yeah. Start. For for uh, three forty five is good. Three forty five with a certain tolerance. Okay. Uh, I will say goodbye. Uh, okay. So also, Professor. Uh, uh, Schmitz would like to say goodbye. He was our partner in this session and he talked a lot, so I had to put the mic, but now we are <laughs> yes. We discussed all your, your lecture. <laughs> so thank you. It was very interesting and uh, I get the opportunity to see some of the students of the doctoral candidates and uh, I will, I'm very happy that I've been here and get an impression how it works. And I think with uh, some of the doctoral candidates, I will uh, continue. And but for this time, I say goodbye. And uh, was very fun to see you. Thank, Thank you. you. Three to uh, uh, but Arab time is four thirty-seven. European time is three thirty-seven, and then we go back to four forty-seven European time. Yes. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, I'd like to, to make sure that uh, what I understand is, uh, is correct uh, concerning you, uh, excuse and forgive. Excuse, uh, I'm, I'm finding a reason for the person. So uh, he's not, he, he shouldn't, uh, he, he, this doesn't mean that he is sinner or uh, the perpetrator or something. So uh, uh, ordinary situation and I, uh, I find there's some excuses for but forgiveness or forgive, I think there, there should be, uh, 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 he, he should be mistaken or uh, has uh, something uh, wrong uh, done, uh, which, which uh, uh, needs the forgiveness. That's a point, okay? Um, and the concerning the power, I think uh, if, if you have, um, if you have uh, interaction between two people, I think the, the victim has a, such a kind of power, the power of right. Maybe um, I'm right or wrong. I don't know. But uh, uh, power here uh, is about the power of right over the perpetrator uh, himself or herself. Uh, concerning also the uh, what you said about uh, uh, the picture uh, or identification and identify, uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, examples uh, related to such a situation uh, like. Uh, uh, when you look at, at a star, okay, this is dead for uh, thousands of years ago, but it's in front of me in the sky, okay? It's not uh, real. Uh, this is a point which uh, goes with uh, the, 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 the idea of, by the way, it's, uh, it's mentioned in, the, in, the, in our holy book in different ways uh, uh, concerning uh, Also, uh, for uh, I cannot hear you at all anymore. And I guess the... I think his mic got uh, disconnected. Yeah, obviously, yeah. I can't see him at all, actually. 
Now I cannot see him anymore. Well, I cannot see him at least. So maybe Luis, you can ask your question as well. So sorry because uh, because my I, I'm suffering uh, the, such such a bad connection. Uh, it's okay for me now in order not to waste time. Okay, so. Uh, just if, as a reaction to that, I didn't understand you completely, but uh, but I guess that I understood the, the idea. So I think what it is important, we said when we discussed from a peace studies point of view, I'm not sure whether the colleagues in Jena agree with all the things that I'm saying. This, this can be checked then in the next sessions later in December and January. But for my, from, from a peace studies point of view, for us, it is so important to make clear whether we perceive peace in a transcendent uh, frame or in an immanent, which means, again, the moral world is transcendent. It refers to God, a God who is a creator, God who is almighty, knows everything and so on. Whereas the immanent refers to a divine principle, all existence is divine, and you can say all aspects of, uh, uh, of all existence are divine. And now we get different language rules from that. Even reconciliation as such, the same word can be interpreted in an immanent or in a transcendent way. It can go to uh, reconciling between the divine and the human sphere, or it can be like a meditative, meditative act, like celebrating uh, silence together, what it etymologically could also mean. And now I referred to these notions of forgiving because we see here the same, and this becomes very clear in these, mm. in these statements of Hölderlin and then of, uh, of, of Hegel, which I presented to you at the beginning. And here again, if we, knew, if we try to analyze the words in their etymological development, we see that this confusion that we nowadays have in everyday language, it doesn't make, if I step on somebody's toes in, in, in the bus, uh, whether I say excuse or pardon or, uh, or forgive me, doesn't make a difference. Yeah, So the people will always take it the same. But if we go into the etymological meaning, we see that forgiveness is something that always refers in a transcendent way in the end to God. So if you make a sin, this is a, this is a religious term, a sin, it is in a, in, a, in a mundane thing, it's just an error, something to do something wrong. We call that a sin. And only God can forgive the sin. Only God. So in the end, it refers to God, forgiveness. Whereas excuses, I take the charge away. And this can happen in the human sphere. So of course, then it's for minor things. First of all, it's, I cannot uh, excuse a sin, literally because I'm not entitled to do so. I can just say, well, the pain that you have done to me, uh, I take the charge for that away from you. And this is still important in an imminent world for getting out of the turning wheel of revenge, of justice and revenge. So that's, uh, that's uh, what, what we go if we are very picky, of course, yeah? I don't say that you, you are not allowed to say, forgive me anymore to anybody in the bus. But the point is that we have to be clear where these words come from and that it has to do with our general understanding of what peace is. Is peace something that we make every moment that we have to struggle for each moment of our life in each encounter with everybody or is peace something that is given to us by god if this peace is given by god then also only god forgives <clears throat> that's logical if peace is created in the system of human existence then it is us who excuse the painful actions of the others so that's just for, uh, for, for being clear language-wise. 
Okay, I hope this is enough, and I hope that the connection allowed you to hear my my answer. And I think Luis is waiting for a long time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, I put my comment, my question in the in the chat. Okay. So uh, maybe uh, you can you can read it. But my my uh, comment was about what about the the recent research that shows that the brain is. Um, uh, connected with the with something like um, the darm, the, the good, the uh, is influence for the intestinal flora. <laughs> I mean, uh, for example, there, there are Maturana and Varela, they, they show us that the environment, the, the brain is not something that is in the school, is something that has to do with your relations with other persons, with your environment. And recent, recent research has shown that there is a kind of second brain that is in our darm. In our, in our darm is, is the German term, in, in good. <laughs> and, and this is not, this is important for understanding interconnectedness and in, uh, for understanding the harmony I, I mean, this is not just, it, it, I, I work with social movements in Latin America and they, when they talk about uh, food, uh, they don't are just talking about food security. They are talking about food sovereignty. And this is a way to gain a capacity to build energetic peace. And so it is uh, it's interesting to see that this discussion with the brain has different connections and different local confirmations. Uh, how is the, the brain connected with the harmonization, with the energetic piece? And the brain is not something that is inside the, the head. It's, it's a, an entanglement of... Uh, of connections and this I, I would like to to know uh, uh, your perspective about this this recent research well this this was not a question this this was already an answer uh, okay. yeah I, I agree completely with what you are saying uh, I mean you you just uh, refer to, to Maturana or we could also use Varela and so on these Latin American schools uh, Naranjo and uh, and more. So all of them are clearly in this imminent worldview. Maturana, I would say, was very interesting because uh, he's older and he started with this work already before system theory really became 100% evident. I would rather say he's a pioneer, a quite strange pioneer of, of system theory because this understanding is a system understanding. And system theory, in the end, if applied to the human sphere, is in the end uh, an argument for an imminent worldview. And then all of that becomes very clear. So what Maturana said long before uh, Damasio, for example, was exactly that, that you cannot separate the human body from the human mind. Yeah? So, I mean, we have many, many words how we can express that, but the message is exactly that, so that you cannot separate. This is what Maturana said. This is why Varela could get along so well with the Dalai Lama. You would say completely different worlds where they come from, but this is exactly what unites them because this goes very close in, an, in a modern scientific way, very close to the, to the uh, cosmovision of Mahayana Buddhism. Yeah, so that there is a lot of, of, of coincidence of overlapping versions, of course, that, that the words that are used are sometimes very different and it takes a long time to understand. This is why I love etymology, because I, if you go deeper into the history of words, you see, ah, yeah, they were already there before. Yeah, so it, and we could even go that far that when what you say about Maturana, yes, this is relatively recent. There are more recent ones, but yes. And then in the end, if you compare Maturana to Spinoza and you are able to translate across the centuries, you see that this is again a very similar understanding. Yeah, and very often these people are not too popular in, in the mainstream of their time because they, um, they question quite a lot of the truths that help the powerful ones to, to dominate the people. Yeah. So this is always revolutionary. 
Yeah, a guy like I mean, I personally I never met Maturana, never met Juan Bar Varela before he died, but I, I I was quite close to Claudio Naranjo, and of course this is I mean a guy like that is a provocation for the dominating ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he's the incarnation of provocation. <laughs> and yeah, I but uh, I, I agree completely with what you're saying. Yeah. So and this was not this was not a question. This was a statement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so and Iyad, was this before a hand of yourself or was it just uh, yes, it, my... was, it was only a comment, but uh, I think you, yeah. you talked about it. I just want to talk about uh, how Nietzsche actually said that when in your previous uh, slides, how identity changes and there's no correct identity. For example, I, I am from Palestine, but I'm living in Germany. After 20 years, I am German or I am Palestinian. Yeah. So this, this is how we can look also to the conflict. So they say they are inheriting the conflict, and even that they don't understand that the identity changes within the conflict, and conflict is in progress of transition. So this is how I, I, I prefer that the, the conflict is not the same conflict that it was 70 years ago, and yeah. it, it go back to the conflict that was 70 years, for example, Israeli-Palestinian, to that conflict that was 70 years ago, how, how it was. They forgot that it has transitional change and transform. And this is what makes the conflict uh, intractable. So what yeah. can we do with that when this transition, how the idea was to transform this transition into reconciliation and peace process. But you know how when you then we go into your transitional shifts, so I don't want to go more because I'm waiting for you to explain how this can happen and, and remove the cycle. Mm -hmm. you know? And this is what I wanted to, to ask you about. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, we are, I think we are more or less jumping into that now. Uh, I'm, I know that I have another session next week. This will be my last one. And well, the rest of this session, of course, and then we see the consequences because what you say uh, about Nietzsche and uh, of course this, this all is very important here. Uh, I would even then go to, well, I already mentioned all the French postmodern philosophers like Lyotard or Deleuze and so on. Uh, they also are very relevant here. Um, and we will see what this means in practical terms. And we are almost there. We have just, I think, one more slide uh, that gives you a, a theoretical um, observation. And then we, we could go into the things that you really can also uh, use in practical peace work, if you, if you agree. So I don't see any more hand, and I will try to do that. Uh, try in literally because now it doesn't move again no okay so this is the last uh, the last uh, comment uh, on this is not by einstein but it is it is rather what the consequence that um, that i would um, draw from this observation uh, on this paradox of in the individual and relation uh, this duality of individual and relation and if it comes, if I mention Einstein and this whole um, uh, physical aspects, uh, well, nuclear physical aspects, of course, then I think that all of you have heard about this paradox uh, uh, that that uh, in, in 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 nuclear physics that uh, a, 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 a phenomenon can be a, re, a wave or a, a particle, uh, and it can be both in the same time, but it depends on the observer uh, what it is. So, and that's that's a quite strange thing. I don't know how you manage to get along with that. Uh, well, I, I I I remember it very well, and it came back to me now with this uh, observation on the humankind as an actor. In, in conflicts and in the, also in the question how we perceive um, peace. And then you can, as a metaphor, this is please not, don't take it as, as, as hardcore uh, science, but just as a metaphor for understanding a little bit what it, where it wants to go, uh, the transrational peace philosophy ascribes the humankind in equal measure characteristics of the one hand of relations and of individuals. So, and if we now see, well, what does what, what does this mean? I am an individual. 
I can I can say that, yeah. So like I can say I observe in microphysics a particle. And then I have my characteristics. If I am an individual, I can only be on one place uh, in, 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 in my body and in, in one moment, of course. Yeah, I can move, but at one moment, I can only be in one place as an individual. But if I say I am at the same time a relation in the human sphere, then I can also expand in space and time like waves. And this can take effect simultaneously, simultaneously in different places. So that means that just what we are doing at the moment. So I'm talking here. I am an individual. I sit in my home office here in front of my computer and I talk. That's what I would say about myself as a human individual in conventional human notion now. But at the same time, the effect of being also a relation takes place in many different ways. For example, now with you, because you are somewhere in, in different countries around the world and you listen and whatever, even if you are totally bored by what I'm saying and if you dislike completely what I'm saying, that is an experience and it has an effect on you. That would be the direct one. But then it goes further because uh, I mean, you are in relation to the people around you. If you live, with, I don't know, with your family, with your friends, in a community, whatever, you, whatever you experience now will have an effect on all of these people. And in that way, radiates uh, my individuality, my very existence uh, around the globe. And since I'm talking a lot and teaching a lot, uh, obviously this, these relations are have their effects in many different places. And this continues. Even if I die in the next moment, still this relational effect will be there. So that means I am, like in microphysics, uh, a relation and an individual simultaneously. And now the question, is this a contradiction? Would you say in a Cartesian sense, no, that's impossible. You can only be one. Or can we accept that the human nature is precisely this simultaneity of this synchronicity of uh, our properties? And in the transrational approach, we say, yes, it is. So therefore, we accept that. And therefore, we get clearly different options of action in time and space compared to a Cartesian approach. And now the peace philosophy that comes from that is very different. OK? Yeah, and this now, if you, if you are still with me, we can go now into the blurred sphere between uh, between theory and practice, because this is now already, well, it is, it, it is the conclusion of all that we have discussed until here. And at the same time, it is already very practical. Uh, this is not simply a diagram of all the things that we have discussed in, in this lecture until here. I make a matrix. I took it principally from Ken Wilber, but this is the, well, just as a reference for mentioning him here. This is, you don't have to know more too much about him. What I simply do is that I say, well, all these definitions of peace that we have discussed until here are relevant because we find them in human realities. Remember to the very beginning when I told you I was traveling, I was working as a young man in different contexts, and I was so overwhelmed by the very different definitions, interpretations of pieces that I received, that I, that I perceived, and, uh, and I tried to systematize that now over decades. Now the result of that can be found in this matrix. What I found that makes sense if I respect all and every, each and every definition because it's human and who am I to disregard definitions that other human beings make. If it comes to peace, it's such a crucial value that every human being has the right to express what peace is for him or her. So I respect them all, even if I don't share them at all, I respect them. 
And then I try to systematize and now comes the answer to the question, why do we have so far four peace families? We have the energetic, we have the moral, we have the modern and we have the postmodern. And this is not just at will because I think four is cool. It is because of these metrics where I found that the idea and the notion of peace has on the one hand, internal aspects and external aspects. Coming back to what we had, it's pretty clear. Internal aspects, I have the feeling of, of the tomato juice between the fingers. That's something very individual. That's a sensation. That's something individual, uh, internal. On the other hand, a fair distribution of goods that's very external, and it also has its point. And then we have this phenomenon that we all that we just discussed in the previous slide is I am an individual and I am relational simultaneously. So that means that also the notion of peace has to be placed in all these fields. I have a singular internal, I have a singular external, I have a plural internal and I have a plural external and now. My observation is this what we call energetic, moral, modern, postmodern mirrors now in the core values of pieces in the respective fields. That means what is peace? The answer to this question depends on the context. We have different answers in different moments and in different contexts to this question. And this can be systematized. This is that I can make thousands of definitions, allow me, well, this is at least, I would say it's an attempt and I think it was successful, allow me to place them in this matrix. And this is what we're going to do now. So first we understand that the human nature is intentional, comes a bit to Louis' point from before. Yeah? So it is not only the expressive intellectual thought constructed in the mind, but we have, as you say, like this guts brain, this, uh, this, this whole system is, 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 is creating and is reacting to impulses. And uh, this has to do with intention. Yeah. Then, what is clear on the outside, each of us behaves in a way. So we have a behavioral aspect that is both on the one hand a sender, my behavior is a sender to the society around me. And uh, also I receive from behavioral impulses and they tell me about my own condition, my own situation. Then, uh, Maybe the most difficult one, I guess, is the internal plural, what is that? So this is what happens in group. We have these group processes already discussed and I call it here cultural. <laughs> Finally, we have the external side, plural, that's now easy because that's more or less what social science is doing. So this is the external plural social aspect of peace. And now how do we fill that? I have here symbols that I will use also in the, for the rest of my lecture. So whenever you identify one of these drawings, you know what I'm talking about. First is what we already discussed, peace out of harmony. So harmony is obviously a feeling. It is obviously something that has to do with relations. Do I feel well in this relation? or in these relations that make me at the moment, do we have harmony? This can be interpreted in the traditional energetic way that we discussed at the very beginning, or I can reintegrate, and this is part of the transrational peace philosophy, that we take the energetic interpretations of pieces back into the modern notion. Because modernity did away with these energetic things. Already the moral tried to overcome and by its orientation, strict orientation on rationality, the modern mind does not like to discuss too much harmony because you know this is like this, 
this feeling of the romantic whatsoever thing. Yeah, but we all when you when you when you ask people what is peace for you personally, you get very often definitions that are placed here. So we had the tomato juice, we had sitting on the, of the, on the banks of the Rio Paraguay and watch the river flow and things like that. Fresh air, that all these are things that are placed here. So we have peace out of harmony that has a lot to do with the internal singular reaction to relations. Because we also said that peace, that the root form of peace out of harmony is peace out of fertility. So it's about mere life energy. So it's life and life. And of course, life is the dance of life that is also lust. So all of that can be found here. In the end, the sophisticated, the philosophical version is peace out of harmony, but it has also more primitive um, notions. Then we have the second one, which is peace, the behavioral aspect, a singular extern. And here it is very clear. This is now, now we have Thomas Hobbes in the story, peace out of security. So the main question that we have into both directions, am I safe here? Am I welcome here? This is what I ask myself because that's a question of life and death. And of course, am I safe for the others? This is what they ask. So by my behavior, they want to know whether they can trust me or not. This is the security point. So we can dislike Thomas Hobbes as much as we want. He has definite a point. You cannot have peace without security. Then the third one is the cultural, as I said, the internal plural, the communal or associational also, the relational. And here it goes, peace out of truth. Meaning, do we have a common frame of reference? Do we have a common language? Do we, do we communicate well? Do we have a common version of what is yes or no? So, and we know how relevant it is because if we just look into history and also, of course, said enough the present times, uh, how many uh, million people have been killed just because of the question uh, what the right name of God is or how you pray properly to God and things like that. These are truth questions. It is about human conventions, interpretations of something very um, important. And of course, even if we say in an atheist sense, well, there is no God and we have to, to follow just our, our rational mind, wonderful, then we only have to agree what the rational mind is. Yeah, and this is quite a job, yeah. So, but in the end, if it comes down to the ground, if we look at everyday's life of people, uh, this is simply about, well, uh, do we have a common language? Like for me here, I'm in a, in a, in a village with 2000 inhabitants. So there are some trigger words, keywords that everybody who belongs to this community knows, and we agree on that. And if you break with this convention, you will be in trouble. But if you get a foreigner comes in, he or she cannot know that. And uh, that's different. So I think also pretty clear, all of you know this experience. And finally, the last one is what we discussed the most. This is the social aspect, the balance. So peace out of justice. We, dis we, we, we problematized the question of justice and we, there was a, a moment probably when you thought, okay, I have to rethink whether I really want justice. Uh, well, I can tell you, you cannot have peace without justice. So all of these keywords, I take this harmony, security, truth, and justice, like the four general directions that you find on the compass uh, in the question of peace. So transrational peace philosophy in the end, is not the fifth one, it is not a new one, it is just the recognition of all the existing ones and the, an attempt to systematize them. So this is when, why is it transrational? Because it accepts all the achievements of modern science, 
So whatever scientifically is proven is accepted. And this goes for all the disciplines, all is welcome. And it says, yes, the human kind is so much more than the human mind. So we have a mind, that's great. We can use it for our all common best. And still we are so much more. So a human existence is more than a mind. And we have to deal with this more and to ask what this more is. I will come to that then with the next uh, slides. Now here for this is, if you want, this is the result of the theoretical, historical, philosophical journey that we have done until here. If you, are, if you have followed me until here, then what you get here is not only double line result. This is the, the slide that explains it all. Not only, yes, but not only. The next thing is you have here a practical tool. Try to understand these metrics here now, like a compass for practical piecework. Why? Because, as I said, uh, well, first of all, as a peace worker, if we agree on an imminent approach, and transrational is imminent, if we agree on an imminent approach, you as a peace worker, and if you understand yourself in a PhD program as a would-be peace worker in the terminology of uh, Adam Curl, then you will never be able to separate yourself from the conflict. Yeah, meaning, just as an example, as a personal example, you know that I recently have been in Iraq, I think the two weeks ago, I taught, taught from Iraq. So when I go to Iraq, it looks like Iraq is far away from Austria. I'm an Austrian. I'm talking now from my village where I was born. And if I travel to Iraq, I go to in a totally foreign, unknown world. And I do not belong there. That is on the one hand true. But on the other hand, if I do practical work there, I become part of the Iraq conflict in the moment that my, my, my airplane lands in one of the cities. That means I step out of the plane with the idea to be a practical, be a practitioner, a practical peace worker. And in this moment, I become part of the conflict. Therefore, my understanding of the conflict is crucial for the conflict. Because here comes, I think uh, all of you who live in, I think Luis, you said, uh, because I see Luis, you, you are from Colombia. So I could also uh, name Colombia. I have been quite a lot in Colombia. I love your country. Uh, same story. If I'm invited, for example, one year after, the, after, after the, the, the peace agreement, I was invited to give a speech and to work, uh, to do workshops with, with Colombians. I don't go into details. In this moment, I land in this case in Cali. I am part of the Colombian conflict. I cannot say, uh, sorry, I'm an Austrian. I'm not involved. The whole idea that UN sells to us that the conflict worker has to be neutral does not work in an imminent world. This only works in a transcendent world. Because then it's clear that you have the higher authority of UN that deploys people and sends them onto spots. And they act in the name of the higher authority. This is, you can identify them with blue helmets and blue vests. This is the UN idea. But if you have ever worked in the practical field in this frame, you realize that as a human being, you cannot disconnect from the conflict. You cannot be neutral. You can try to be, I even think impartial is not possible. I think the only thing you can be is all partisan. Why? Because you are, yes, a visitor in the conflict, and that means that if you want to serve the people on the spot, you have to serve everybody. This must be the attitude. So I, I cannot go to Colombia and be impartial. 
But if I want to serve everybody, this includes the paras and this includes the, the FARC and the, well, whoever you want, yeah. And this includes even the drug dealers because they are the Colombians, I have to serve them. And if I go to Afghanistan, I have to serve the Taliban because they are Afghans. And if I think, no, I don't like them, then I don't go. Nobody forces me to, to sign a contract for working for the UN. So this is, we have, we have a lot of troubles with this principle of neutrality, right? And this is an official, this is terms of reference in the UN system. I think we don't have time to go further into that, but I can become very emotional if it comes to this point, because I suffered too much myself and I saw too many people breaking in that, yeah? So peace workers who broke because of that. So, however, the point is, let's come back to this point here, is that we don't believe in this neutrality. That means that whatever I, however I prepare myself for the conflict, preparing means I gather information, I read this information, and I can only read it as the one who I am. Experience made me the one I am before diving into the conflict. So I can read on this space and I can prepare myself with all kinds of information that is available. And then I go, which means I am already biased. I have already a version of the story in my mind before I arrive. And now comes the, the decisive practical point here. The conflict has eyes. The conflict is not an abstract thing, but because people live under difficult conditions in conflict, they are super careful with visitors. I, again, I see Luis and therefore I can talk about Colombia, but I know there are Palestinians and there are, well, are people from the Middle East in general. You all know what I mean. If these people with their blue helmets come in, you know that they are going to involve themselves and they change just by the very present, even if they are only observers, they change your reality. Everybody on the spot knows that. Everyone that's on the spot is already in troubles. This is the reason for having a mission. And therefore they are super careful and highly attentive if it comes to visitors. So what do I say with that? Is when I get out of the plane, and I say, hello, conflict, the conflict has eyes, will be super uh, sensitive and see what kind of person is coming. And here we go with the general directions. Is this guy coming with a justice story? Is this guy coming with a true story? Is this guy coming with a security story? And is, or is this guy coming with a harmony story? And depending on the perception that the conflict has from this arriving peace worker, the conflict will communicate. I don't know whether this is too abstract, but I can give you an example from my own experience that I once had in, in Uganda. When I worked in Uganda, uh, I, I, I was there for evaluating projects, so we, I was not bringing whatever, I was just evaluating. This was my job for the Austrian ministry. And, uh, and I realized when I went to the offices of the different local NGOs, that there, um, the, pe the people who welcomed me and spoke to me about the, the concrete uh, projects, that they were very careful with finding out what my background is. And they were super smart with identifying, for example, is this guy coming from a trade union background or is he coming from uh, a church? usually a Christian church there. Yeah, in Uganda, it could also be Muslim, but this was unlikely in my case. So, but Christian, if Christian, what kind? Is it rather a Catholic conservative or is it one of these progressive liberation uh, churches or whatever, or even a, a branch of the Catholic? Uh, um, uh, or is it more coming from an economic background? Is, it, is he a representative of whatever business things and so ever? And they had their reports and their uh, drafts ready 
according to what they see. So they had it, it was pre-made in their computers and they just had the right wording, the right trigger words for the right background. And of course, when I start with a justice course and, and, and just give them the idea, well, I'm concerned because the level of income is so different in, uh, in Uganda, they will immediately react and give me what I want to, what I want to hear or what I want to read. And they can, it is because they are professionals, they can immediately react to that. Or you come with, let's say, a truth, more concretely, a, a, a religious background, they know it immediately. Yeah, And I mean, they have, for example, in, in case of Uganda, it's interesting, they have tailor-made pro, uh, projects for Muslims or for Christians. You can have the same project in two versions. And the same goes, is it a security question and so on. So that means the conflict as such, and this is not only for the professional NGOs, but this is also for the real parties in the mud. The ones who really suffer, they also are human beings and can read the other because they are human. So that means they immediately one will tell you the story that you want to hear. And therefore, it is very important in the pre-deployment pre preparation that you are aware of what had you put on when you go. So be aware of yourself. Don't go with an unconscious belief, set of beliefs that you just take from your own background and take it into another environment. Here, I mean, all of us come from somewhere and we are uh, shaped by, our minds are shaped by the experience where we mainly come from. But as a transition act, as a pre-deployment act, we have to work on our own uh, self-awareness on how to deal with conflicts and who we are, because the conflict worker is the most important tool, the most important instrument that he or she has in mission. So talking, if you, if you aspire to, to be uh, a conflict worker in the future, this is very clear. The instrument that you have to prepare and refine is yourself. You are the most important. Therefore, the, to work on the awareness, on the self-awareness is so crucial. And one part is that you can check that you can do reality checks constantly with yourself when you just have a look. Okay, am I in general somebody that believes peace has to go with justice or peace has to go with security or peace has to go with truth or peace has, has to go with harmony? These are the, the trigger words, I would say, the main trigger words that can be uh, used for a first step of self-analysis. And then, well, the first is who am I? Do I generally tend to think that there cannot be GPs without justice? And justice is the, the equal distribution of goods and income or, well, whatever is it. So check yourself. There is no wrong, wrong or right. There's just the observation. The only thing that you can do wrong is not being aware of yourself. This is the point here. And then since it is relational, the question is, well, who am I? From which general direction do I approach the conflict? Because the conflict that I as eyes and sees me coming from north, south, east, west. And the other thing then is, well, how do I perceive the conflict? What is my version of the conflict? And then once I say, well, okay, we are in this conflict, we have a justice problem, then you can check, 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 and you have other options. If you are right, according to your analysis, because there is never an ultimate truth, there is only an opinions, then you can imagine this fundament that I have here in this matrix, like a, like a boat on a lake. Yeah, so what are we doing? Since there is no conflict resolution in this system, there's no end of the story, never, as long as human beings are alive. So the question is only how can we transform 
That's the technical term that we use, conflict transformation, not resolution. And how do I transform? This uh, is, can be done by homeostasis, which is balance. So the main point of conflict work is balancing. And usually if we have conflicts that require external help, then we see that society's relations are extremely unbalanced. Or in other words, yeah, I, I gave you the metaphor of the boat, that is that in this floating boat where you could have a balance of the four directions values, uh, then the boat is more or less like floating on the, on the surface of the, of the lake. But if everybody in the boat jumps on one spot, I think everybody has already experienced that what happens, children do it usually when they play, yeah, so everybody on one side. So what goes is the boat goes out of balance. It gets very unstable. And conflict work in this case means I counter balance. And that's the purpose of the job. So the purpose is not finding a solution. And it is not about your own creativity. It is rather to bring impulses that allow the people themselves to move in the boat and to find places where they feel more comfortable because not everybody is focusing on the same. So very often this has to do with, uh, with a, a sort of a counter discourse. If everybody talks about, we're very prominent in the 21st century, if everybody talks about security, uh, and is so fascinated by security, people tend to ignore harmony. So can you insert a harmony discourse in this reality? Or can you call the attention of the parties to the question of harmony? And if I just I told you about my, my personal experience, I think Iraq is a perfect example. If you hear the word Iraq, everybody thinks of security. Because in Iraq, people are killed, people are, uh, there, are, there are missiles, there are bombs, booby traps, whatever you want, mines, and so on. But it is not, it is not the whole truth. Iraq is so much more than a security problem. And most people who live there, they want to have a daily life. They don't want to be concerned of security all the time. And they do not. They have a different way to deal with that. So what about the other aspects? Can you uh, invite the people to explore the options of alternative perception and alternative action in their reality that would allow the boat to balance, to float in a more balanced way? That's, that's where, what it goes for. And this is only the fundament. This is why we have elaborated that all that we are aware of these core values. And very often you find in acute conflict situations that one of these terms has got out of, of um, aware of the awareness of the consciousness of the people. Uh, I see a hand, I see more hands. Oh, sorry, I talked and talked. Um, Iyad, I don't see you, but I see an, 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 a digital hand. Is this, ah, now I see you, okay. How do I interpret your hand? Yeah, my hand is, uh, or maybe we can let the one person. I cannot hear you. Are you asking me? I cannot first? hear you. I can, can you hear me now? Hello? I, Hello? Uh, okay, then it's probably mine. Let me see. So I wanted to ask. Can yeah, you, okay, now I hear you. Okay, no, sorry. I want to ask you about the, uh, um, we talk about in, uh, power relations. And as you see in reconciliation, as I do a research at an ultra dynamic level. Sorry, I hear a lot of things. I'm not, I'm not sure what's going on. Okay, now can you hear me? I hear you, but I hear more than you. Yeah, yeah I know some people who were on. Yeah, please uh, switch the microphones off and then just one. I, again, please, uh, I repeat, I didn't understand. Okay, okay. So, so in three relations, there's the, like the power relation. Yeah. And according to Nietzsche, there's an ultra-dynamic relation that develops into power. 
So can you can we say that there's an ultra-dynamic powers that are shifting between the intentional behavior and social culture and, and social currents all together in a, in a, in a, in a uh, uh, recursive way? And what do you think the ultra-dynamic power that can make this change transform? So is it the human, or in my point of view, I might think reconciliation can do that, for example. But before, I was thinking that reconciliation will, do, will develop the, the spin, and the ultra-dynamic power will be the many pieces, for example. Now, inside the many pieces, it can be the ultra-dynamic power. And what do you think the ultra-dynamic power that can shift the many pieces from one piece to the other? If you know that they can make the transformation happen, so so usually in, in, in this it's called applied Fermius, and the guy who researches the ultra dynamic power is the Theronymus, and it is us, and then in reality it then transform into it's working by itself forever, so it keeps spinning, and then the ultra dynamic changes, so that's why I call it ultra dynamic power. So in in your theory, in transitional pieces, do you know what is the ultra dynamic powers that can shift all of them together? And maybe go into a reconciliation process, or it is the adverse yeah. versus where you do develop practices of reconciliation and the knowledge of reconciliation and the ultra dynamic power is many pieces. Mm -hmm. So this is my question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I would say that power is inherent uh, to human relations in general. So you cannot have any of that without power. The question is: uh, Is the how how is uh, where is the power concentrated? And if it comes, if we see that these aspects are out of balance, usually, um, well, not usually, always, uh, we see a focus on power on one of them. So, I mean, the, the classical and easiest example, because it's on the outside, it's vis visible, is the security aspect. Of course, if you have factions in a, of a gr groups in in a society that rearms strongly and that use physical violence against others, uh, then it, it's very obvious. Yeah. Then, then, of course, also in the structural peace, fear, injustice, same story. Uh, if there if there is a, a very uneven distribution of, of, of income of um, and of goods and so on, then we, we this justice problem is of course also a power problem. In the cultural, the same, if there is one group dominating the truth about human existence, very often we have factional um, religious groups, for example, and so on, then it's getting out of balance there. So I see the power question everywhere involved there, even in harmony. Yeah? I mean, for example, sometimes you find that in sects and so on, that, that, that certain uh, procedures, certain rules are completely overemphasized there. So I think that's always the, the power is everywhere here. And what you said, and what can re reconciliation do? I think here it's a vocabulary question because uh, I mean, what can we do? We can reconcile. So I would say reconciliation here is another word for conflict transformation. It means in the end the same. Given that we are aware whether we move in a transcendent or in an imminent worldview, this makes a difference. But if we say reconciliation perceived as an imminent endeavor, I would say it's just the same. It's just another word for the same procedure. Yeah. So then and another word that also applies here, so this is a sort of a tautological circle, would be the, the system theory word homeostasis. Because what is homeostasis is, is just balancing the different poles of an oscillating system. It's always this constant dance around the gravitation point that we shall never reach because in the gravitation point we have system death. Yeah? So that means it is always the dance of life around a balance that we never get. And if this is in a way in a smooth movement, we can call it reconciliation, we can call it conflict transformation, what so on. If it gets to the extremes, if it's very strong out of balance, we might get in the human system to a bifurcation point, and the bifurcation point includes the possibility of collapse. This can happen, yeah. So, but in general, I would say that it is just a vocabulary question and uh, and we mean very similar things here. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah thank you. And then Ravan. 
Yes, thank you, Professor. So I would like to go back to your example about Uganda, because yeah. this happens a lot with us also in, in our work. But if everybody, like they're super smart, that they can play you to show you what they what they want you to see from that part of conflict, then how can you identify what is the type of conflict? And then what, what kind of piece do we need for this particular conflict? <laughs> Yeah, that's a very practical question. Yeah. Well, the first thing is that you uh, pre-deployment uh, information so that you get as much as possible. Uh, usually you don't start from the crutch out of the blue. I mean, you are not the first pioneer ever coming into an environment. There is a reason why you go, there is a pretext. So you get the information uh, from the pretext and then you try to embed it into your own understanding. Depending on, uh, again, who sends you, uh, who, uh, well, how free are you in your decisions? I mentioned now the UN system, you are not very free if you go with the UN. You have very strict terms of reference and what you think doesn't um, matter too much anyway. So, but there are, if it comes more to the NGO world, uh, first of all, different NGOs are in different way flexible. Uh, and also they are in different ways well structured, which means uh, weaker NGOs and you are far away in a, on a personal deployment, far away from the center, it, that gives you much liberty. But of course, also much more responsibility for possible failure. So how can you do it? Well, just as I said, you try to be prepared. We have this wonderful saying, practical saying, um, proper preparation prevents piss poor performance, which means you try to get as informed and as structured as possible. And then, um, sorry if I use too much of soldiers language here, but I worked a lot with soldiers. What they then say, um, no plan survives the first shot which means once you are there and things become real, you have to be very flexible. You, you need all the structure of the preparation in order to be flexible on the spot, because there you will be surprised over and again. And then well prepared, which means you're physically, mentally, emotionally fit, you can react, you are flexible, and based on what you're prepared, you can, you can change opinions. And this is, uh, from my experience, the only chance that you have. Um, there is, there is no uh, chance for you just to, to, to get that truth before you go and then uh, act on a, on a complete stable structure. That's, that does not exist. Yeah, but it, it is a game. Yeah, so this is what I just said before is the conflict has eyes. So be prepared for that. They watch you from the first moment you arrive and they try to have an idea of who you are and they will play the game with you. And the only thing since both you and the others and the conflict, all of that is human, you just can accept the dance, the invitation and play the game. Yeah. And then of course you can also say, say well, it's not so different to do very, very normal private encounters. Say, what are we doing if we meet somewhere and we, have, we don't know each other yet? Of course, we are also playing, we're doing the same dance. I send you some impulses, I see how you react. I draw my conclusions, I adapt, and this is the same as what you are doing. Yeah, so that's, I think that's pretty human. Yeah, uh, just be aware of that. What from my decades of experience, I'm so astonished how unaware people are. So for me, the scandalous thing in these international missions is usually that people go sort of prepared. Yes, they have read a book about it or they have read some, some manuals that they have got, but in, the, in reality, the goal is, is very ignorant in, into very touchy uh, contexts. And this is what is the scandal for me and what made me also uh, develop this transrational concept uh, long ago because I saw that and, and I find it really scandalous because if people go just because they get well paid uh, on an international mission, they are another burden on the shoulders of people who are already in troubles. And this is unacceptable from my point of view. Okay. Okay, thank you. And then Luis, the Colombian case.
I cannot hear you, Luis, but you, I think your mic is muted. Sorry. Uh, thank you. Um, in the ecology, there is one interesting concept that is the concept of diffusion. Uh, the dynamics of uh, how something diffuse in the system. Yeah. Have you have you reflected uh, on this uh, on, on this uh, concept of diffusion? I mean, for for understanding how to bring, for example, the discussion of our harmonization into a, uh, uh, an, a scenario where the security is is um, uh, is predominant. So mm -hmm. the basic question is, if there is some kind of thinking in practical uh, questions, uh, there is in, in your work, in your, uh, uh, in your uh, definition or something about the diffusion of different rationalities of peace? Mm -hmm. Yes, but not as a, not, not as a goal in that sense, uh, because one of the principles of transrational peace work is that the dynamics of the conflict and the conflict transfer, transformation, or let's call it reconciliation here, has to be in the hands of the parties. So I, as a conflict worker, do not bring solutions. Yeah. And this is, again, since this is a very vain discipline, uh, it is it's a hard lesson to be learned that it is not about, for the conflict worker, it's not about how smart you are. It's not about how creative you are. The point is that you have always to be clear that the stakeholders of the conflict are the ones who explore and find and try alternative options of encounter and action. That is the point. So what you are, what you are as a conflict worker is a frame giver, is a provider, is maybe a moderator, but you are always on the frame that you have to be clear of this role. This is you are involved because you make the frame. So it's different of no, not having this frame but you are not the one who jumps into the shoes of the of the conflict uh, parties and makes their decisions or gives them advice as how to act so what we don't do we are not like in kindergarten telling the children do this or that and then, then you will be fine but the point is we respect the parties as who they are and this is sometimes difficult because they do things that we do not like at all so we have to respect that still and then provide the frame that allows them to find their, um, their, their, their alternative options and then act accordingly. This is what we are doing. And now th this makes it difficult to answer your question because the solution or the, 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 the way of reconciliation, the way of conflict transformation that they find cannot disseminate because it belongs to them. So that means if it works here in this case, we don't have any promise, any guarantee that it will work somewhere else too. So this is not medicine. It is not that you have a vaccine and you know that this works here and it, in whatever human body you use, it will have the same effect. This is not the case in our, for us. So therefore, the only thing that they can disseminate is this awareness of the conflict worker. And if you meant it like that, I can say, yes, I see that anyway, that um, however you call it diffusion or how it dissemination or whatever word you like, this is what I see. I'm pretty astonished how this approach to conflict work is, uh, can be found in the meantime everywhere in the world. Some places like your country is, of course, very famous for that because, sorry, I have to sniff. <coughs> sorry. So, uh, it's very popular because, for example, John Bolederach worked a lot in Colombia and he's one of the masters of this technique, yeah, and probably the most important among the living ones. So, and Colombia had the privilege to work with him. 
which does not mean that he converted Colombia into a paradise, as you may know, it's not. But I think he achieved a lot and many people in Colombia picked that up and it happens now in different contexts without him even knowing the context. Yeah, so this is, I mean, I think Colombia is here really a very good example. And he worked also a lot in Nepal, is very similar, and in Bosnia and so on. And then I'm very close to him. I mean, he's a bit older than me and I learned a lot from him, but we do very similar things. And then also, um, well, our school has its impact in some countries among them, uh, anyway, also Colombia, but Brazil and, and many more. So. Uh, and then you are astonished. I mean, very often I see that the, the understanding of conflict work can be found in places where none of us has been. So it, it, the system itself reproduces that and people pick it up and do it. And it's very important. So please no copyrights on that. So all the things that I tell you, please go and tell to everybody, that's very fine. Sometimes I'm even asked uh, by students, can we use your slides? Yes, please take them. Yeah. So that, that graphic designer who drafted the principle has been paid, no, no problem with her, and the rest is, is it belongs to mankind. Yeah, so this is like, like a Buddhist Thank principle. you very much. We are putting it online, Professor. Okay, yeah. I know anyway. Yeah. In the website. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, uh, was this satisfying, Louis? Yes, thank you, thank yeah, you. Okay, good. Okay, so this is about what we have discussed now. We have just three minutes, two, two minutes. Uh, just, say, well, maybe we leave it here and then we start from, from here next time. But what I want to say is now again, this is just the fundament. This is not the building. Yeah, so we will try. We have three more hours. Let us try to, to, to see the whole building the next time. Uh, that is based on this fundament. But since we have to, to make a break now, I, I invite you just to, to um, integrate this, this metaphor of the boat. So try to imagine like a, a floating boat or a ferry, whatever you want, uh, that is on a, on a calm lake, whatever surface floating along, and then imagine people on this boat moving to just one corner, all of them. And then you see how it gets out of balance. What would you do? Well, you go back. And even if everybody is well distributed and you have more or less a balance, still it is there's movement. And movement can, if a storm comes up or if a stream uh, catches you, whatever, it can get out of balance again. So this would be human reality. This is what happens anyway. And now the question is what kind of intervention is allowed in a transrational sense and also the awareness that here everybody really existing is involved. So we are not excluding people. We don't talk in a should. Should is, is a word that we try to, to not to use because should always gives us the ideal of the good ones and we exclude the bad ones. No, all the ones, even the ones with the bad reputation, yeah, the, uh, the, the well, whatever, as I said, uh, the, the IS and the Taliban and uh, the narcos from Colombia and what else countries do we have here, all of them are at least in principle invited. Why? Because they are human. So we do not exclude human groups. We do not exclude human beliefs, but we try to balance them. That's the main point. So therefore this principle, maybe I finish with that because it's a, also could also be an invitation. This for the conflict worker, the principle of shake hands with the devil has to be applied. This is what a training of a conflict worker means. You have to be able to shake hands with the devil. And you know, I, I hope when I use this, this phrase, you know what I'm referring to. This goes to the to, to, to the famous movie this, under this title, Shake Hands with the Devil, that describes how uh, and, uh, the, the, the commander of the UN troops disobeying to the, to the advices of UN saved them some thousand lives in Rwanda during the genocide there. Yeah, so this is a movie and I think this example is really interesting because this is the main point. So, Am I able as a conflict worker to shake hands with somebody uh, whom I know that I, 
I do not agree at all. And I can never like whatever. Can I shake the hand knowing that this hand has killed? Yeah. So, and can I do that for the sake of peace? That's that's a question. It's really a tough question. And uh, and you are not obliged to to say hundred percent yes. Again, just be aware. And if you are not ready for that, please don't go. Don't get into such a situation. That's the point. Yeah, you see, we are getting more more on the ground and more to the applied things. Uh, and this, I promise, next uh, next time will be less theoretical, less philosophical, and more hands on. Yeah, I think it's. It's time, yeah, it is time to stop. I see Ayat is already getting, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, he's just. He, no, I am answering you, Professor. I had the chance to speak with a guy who has blood on his hand, a soldier, and he wanted to shake my hands, and I refused. I couldn't. Okay. It's not yes. me who did not want, but it was in a peace conference. But what I did not want that if I shake my hands, every people who believe what I'm doing is shaking hands with a guy who killed a lot of their people. And this was yeah. like, uh, it would be on all tabloids and everything that I shook his hand and I'd be really destroyed by the culture that I come from. So this was one of the hardest things to do that he wanted peace, but you cannot just shake hands on and yeah. say, you know, it, he wanted the, the shake of the hands to say to everyone that oh, we just forgot. I tell him, you cannot forget. You can forget, yes. forgive, but not forget. This was my intuition. But it was very hard to not. And yeah. To, well, so the point is here, I don't say you have to or you don't have to. The point here is be aware of how far you can go. Yeah, because I mean, now we had this shake hands with the devil, the word that expression itself is very extreme. And, uh, and it's clear here we talk about extremes, but there are only. So what about shaking hands with a corrupt person? or somebody who is cheating his wife or whatever. I mean, so we can make it softer mm -hmm. and then you will have to find out where your limits are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with a drug dealer, with, um, yeah, what do you like? Yeah, mm -hmm. so I, the point is that the training of the peace worker has to uh, help the student to find these things out. And of course, this can later change when you make the additional experience in life, this can change. But mostly, especially, well, if we talk about young people who are in their 20s, when they come to studies, they have not yet explored all of these aspects of their personality. And we will talk about precisely about that next time, which aspect of your personality is relevant for applied peace work. Yeah, and we will not find answers to you who are in the lecture, so you don't have to be afraid. We are not going to expose you, but I will invite you to reflect for yourself where you are in these different levels. Okay. Okay. Good. I think that that was pretty, pretty well to end, to end here, and uh, we have an interesting session still to come. Yeah. That's excellent. Okay, then I thank you for your attention for today. Anything else yet that you have to announce? Or? No, no, everything is okay, but I announced that all the lectures are being, uh, you know, published online on the website of the Armenia. So yeah. people can go online and check the website which videos are published. So okay. come to all of them. That I also want to tell you that. It's okay to okay. publish your lectures. Yeah. That's the only thing I would announce. Okay. Good then, thank you and see you again in a week. Yeah, have a nice time in between. You too, thank, you, thank, you so thank you, Professor. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. I, I will end the session now. <laughs>